Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Richard Bradbury. He's a senior lecturer, lecturer in clinical microbiology and molecular biology at Federation University. And we're going to talk about his work on parasites. So, Rich, thanks for coming. Thanks very much. I appreciate you having me um, uh, come on. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you work on many different parasites. I, I guess a lot of uh, scientists focus on one, but what, what, what is your research about? Well, I'm, I'm really interested in human parasites generally, um, but I'm particularly interested in uh, zoonotic parasites, so those which we acquire from animals. and um, yeah, I do. I do a pretty. I remain pretty broad. My background was in hospital laboratories, where I did a lot of parasitology, and so I've uh, worked on a lot of different parasites, and I try and work on many today. So, my my big focus is really diagnostics and epidemiology. So, trying to find better ways to test for parasites, and also where are they, and who's got them, and that sort of information then feeds into obviously a public health control program so we can try and reduce the burden of parasitic disease on people around the world. So. Um... Do you focus on parasites in Australia or in the US or worldwide? I've like done a bit of everything, you know. Um, I've, I've done quite a lot of work in, in the Pacific Islands, um, particularly the Solomon Islands, looking at what's called soil transmitted helminths. So these are, um, these are interesting. There's an interesting group of worms actually called soil transmitted helminths. And uh, they're found in many of the low income countries around the world. But one of the one of the mistakes people often make is assuming that they're purely tropical and many of them actually can occur in temperate regions, but in underserved populations. So people who are, you know, have limited access to health care or poverty or something like that. And we still have some issues with that, for instance, in Australia and remote Aboriginal communities, there's still problems with soil transmitted helminths and particularly one called Strongyloides, which is a really nasty worm. Strongyloides, um, is one which gets into your gut. And once you've got it, if you're not treated, you've got it for life. So I always like to say love is passing, but strong aloides is forever. So uh, it's a really nasty worm. What's fascinating is, you know, if you've been exposed to this at any time in your life, you can still have infection decades later. So quite a recent study in Australia tested Australian Vietnam veterans and found that 12% of them were still infected with strong aloidiasis over 40 years since the end of the conflict in Vietnam. Does so, it go dormant or what the people feel well, anything? Relatively dormant. We're, we're still working out exactly what it does during that chronic phase. Um, some people appear to be what we call asymptomatic, so they have no disease symptoms whatsoever. Others may have some issues. They get skin rashes. They, um, they may, for instance, have some issues with diarrhea and things like that. What's a real problem is if you get immunosuppressed. So as you get older, you start to have diseases, you know, which may lead to you being immunosuppressed for one reason or another. For instance, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which you can get from smoking too much. People, doctors might put you on what's called corticosteroids to deal with that. There are, there are several others, but particularly if we immunosuppress people with corticosteroids, this worm really goes crazy. Um, because there's a nice balance between the immune system and the worm until you get immunosuppressed. And then what they do is they basically go splat and all of the larvae, which are like the baby stage of the worm, crawl through your organs. And you can die from that. It's, it's quite commonly fatal. It's called systemic strongyloidiasis. So it's not just a case of you've got a worm and you're a little bit sick and you have a little bit of diarrhea. This can be really serious. And we're quite concerned about it. Um, in specifically in, in, in Australia, we have a lot of problems with it in um, Aboriginal people from remote Aboriginal communities can have a problem with this. And we're trying to control that at the present moment. But it's not just there. You know, there's still cases occurring in the United States in some of the sort of lower income areas. And we're really a bit concerned about that. So that's just one example of some of the issues you can have with parasites. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have pets and you're never alone. But really, these are the kind of pets you'd prefer not to have. So um, is there a, uh, I know, is there a parasite panel that you can take to test for all kinds of potential parasites that might be bothering you? Look, there are some things available. Um, a lot of 
modern diagnostic laboratories will use what's called PCR, which is where we test fecal samples for um, the DNA of parasites being present. And it's, it's, it's very accurate most of the time. So certainly that's run a lot, but often these don't detect every parasite. So um, we still often use traditional methods where we might look microscopically at someone's fecal sample. And the other thing we sometimes do is that we get blood samples. So we'll take your blood and we'll look for antibodies to specific parasites. And that can help us determine if you're infected, particularly for those which are not found in the gut, because some of these worms don't just hang out in your gut. There's others which can, for instance, get into the brain. There's one which you get from the pork tapeworm. This is one, people make the assumption it's from eating pork, but that's not actually the case. The natural cycle of the pork tapeworm, which is called tenia solium, is that it's found in the muscles of pigs and humans eat, undercooked pork, which has the little larval stage of this worm in it. And they may not even see that that's there. It's very small. And in the human, it then forms a large tapeworm in their gut and they pass the eggs of that tapeworm in their feces. Now, the bad news is if you happen to get exposed to those eggs from someone's feces and then what the worm does, it thinks it's in a pig. It doesn't know what to do. So it starts to form these little larval cysts in your muscles and often in the brain. And this is one of the more common causes of adult onset epilepsy in low income countries. So there's a really fascinating case from years ago of a um, Orthodox Jewish family in New York who all got neurocystosarcosis, which is what we call the disease when the larval stage of the tapeworm gets into your brain. And it was a bit of a conundrum because obviously, you know, Orthodox Jewish people do not eat pork. And so we're wondering, well, how did this happen? Yeah, that doesn't look good for them, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's like, well, what's going on here? Well, when you understand, and this is why it's really important for us to do the research to understand the biology of these parasites so that we can work out how people have got infected. When you understand the biology, you realise that these people were not infected from eating pork. What actually happened was they had um, someone who was preparing their meals who had the tapeworm in their gut and those eggs got into the food. And as a consequence, they ended up with a worm went, oh, we, you know, Wait, so food. someone someone merely preparing their meals did that? How did that happen? Yeah, if you know, if this is why we're we're pretty thorough about um, people who are doing meal preparation, washing their hands and following really strict hygiene procedures. Obviously, there's issues with things like you know salmonella and some of those bacterial diseases. But if someone were to prepare your meals and they had this tapeworm in their gut and they didn't. Um, wash their hands and be thorough about hygiene, it might be possible that you could ingest some of these eggs. And then what happens is you get the larval stage in your brain, which is fairly debilitating and not very good. Um, now, we can't test that easily. Obviously, we can't just go in and do a brain biopsy. You can do medical imaging. So you can do MRIs and things and see the little cyst in there. And then what we do to confirm it is we take your blood and look for antibodies to the tapeworm to confirm that you have that infection. Um, and then, of course, the doctors will go through the process of, uh, of treating that and managing it. But um, I, I would point out this isn't terribly common in places like America or Australia, but it's certainly you know, not impossible. And in some parts of the world, it's, it's not an uncommon tapeworm for people to have. So um, what's your main focus? And you know, it sounds like you have a broad knowledge of many parasites. Are you trying to see how I know they all evade the immune system? Or like what's What's your theory or your summation in looking at all these parasites? What are you trying to figure out? Okay, so what I'm trying to do is, you know, I do look at a lot of different parasites and I'm really interested in what parasites are found where. So who's got which parasites and what are they doing to the people in those places? So um, there are some parasites I specifically focus on. One of them is strongyloides, which I mentioned earlier, that worm that's found in people who, um, for instance, can be found in Vietnam veterans and in um, remote communities in Australia. There are many others which are of interest, such as Toxicara. Um, we recently did a survey for Toxicara in Mississippi. Now, Toxicara is a dog roundworm, and its normal cycle is that you know puppies have it and dogs have it and it lives in their gut. But if we're unlucky and we happen to eat the eggs of this particular worm, it gets into our muscles and sometimes into even our eyes and our brains. And we had a case which I was involved with recently in Mississippi or a cluster of cases where people had got this worm in their eyes and it had led to either blindness or severe vision loss. Consequently, we said, okay, this is a problem or appears it might be a problem. So we're going to follow this up and try and work out how much of a problem is this in the state of Mississippi? And I did this work when I was at the CDC, um, working closely with Associate Professor Charlotte Hobbs from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And myself and many colleagues at the CDC, obviously we don't do any of this work alone. It's done as a, as a team effort. Uh, we had a look at 
the blood of, uh, you know, we got a lot of blood samples from people who live in Mississippi and looked for antibodies to this worm. And we found that up to 8% of people in Mississippi have this worm, which is higher than the national average in the United States. Now, most of those people are not sick. They're just wandering around with larval stages of this worm in their muscles or in their organs. And the weird part is they don't get sick with it most of the time. But if you're unlucky and you get a heavy burden in something like your liver, or if one of the worms goes to your eye or your brain, you can get very, very sick. And so we're now following up on that increased um, rate in Mississippi and trying to just figure out, you know, why is that happening and how can we control that disease there? So a lot of what I do is I assist, sorry, I, I assist a lot of people with the diagnostics when they have something like a parasitic disease outbreak, then they contact me and, um, you know, I can help them out with uh, doing a lot of the testing and providing advice on it. Um, I like a lot of the weird and exotic ones, which we can talk about a bit later and, uh, um, I've got quite good over the years uh, through many great mentors, including I'd like to shout out to Henry Bishop at CDC, who taught me a hell of a lot when I was working there, um, at identifying some of these weird things. And so often when there's something really strange and no one knows what it is, they'll send it to me and uh, I'll have a bit of an idea sometimes of what it is and I'll dig down through the literature to discover. So what are some of the, I don't know, strange effects that people have that don't seem to have a reason that end up being parasites, you know, strange symptomology well, you know, yeah that's a common thing isn't it you know we there's something called delusional parasitosis and this is a psychiatric disease which some people suffer from and they actually have a delusion that they have a parasitic disease so they may think that they've got for instance worms crawling under their skin when they don't and this is quite persistent and these people often are otherwise very well um but they really do suffer from this delusion and it can be hard to deal with. And what happens is they often go to a lot of doctors saying, look, I think I've got this. The doctors can't find anything. And then they get moved into more of a sort of psychiatric management. Now, the thing which is important with that is that the doctors really do need to check and make sure the person really does not have truly a parasitic disease. And I'll give you an example of a case of this. Um, a professor who taught me a lot of what I know was Professor John Goldsmith from University of Tasmania. And I come from Tasmania in Australia. And they had a case of a guy who'd been a prisoner of war of the Japanese during the Second World War on the Burma Thailand Railway. A lot of the Tasmanian soldiers were captured at Singapore and ended up prisoners of war. And 40 years later, he went to his doctor and said, I've got worms crawling under my skin. And of course, the doctor immediately said, well, that sounds like delusional parasitosis. We're going to give you a psychiatric consult. So we got a psychiatric consult and they, um, they decided that this guy's condition was because of his war service and he was put on a special pension, etc. Now, a couple of years later, he happened to go to um, a hospital and they tested his species because he had diarrhea. And it turns out he still had strong aloides 40 years after he'd returned from Southeast Asia. He'd never otherwise left Tasmania um, and it's not present in Tasmania. So we're sure he acquired it during the service in World War II. Um, now, this is an example of where someone's been you know, mischaracterized as having a psychiatric condition when actually he really does have worms crawling under his skin because at one stage of the disease, the larval stages can crawl under the skin of the buttocks and the abdomen and you can actually see your allergic reaction as, uh, as these things crawl and they move relatively quickly under the skin. Um, so the, the, the funny part, of, well, maybe not funny, but the part at the end of that, which was odd, was the guy was quite upset that he'd been diagnosed because he lost his special pension for, uh, for his war service as a consequence. <laughs> So this happens a lot where we get people who have odd, odd parasitic infections and they'll go to their doctor and say, you know, I think I've got a parasite. And it's really important that they should be thoroughly investigated by a competent laboratory um, to just make sure that they don't actually have one. We had another case, um, which I dealt with when I was at CDC in the United States of a lady who came to a doctor saying, I'm pulling worms out of my eye. And this was a bit disturbing. And initially you'd think, well, that's a bit odd. But she actually brought in a worm she'd pulled out of her eye. And this was uh, then sent on by the local state public health laboratory to the CDC. And there we found that this was a really unusual worm called Thalasia gullosa. And you get this from face flies when they come and feed on, on you know, they, what they'll normally do is um, they'll feed on the face of dogs or cattle who have a bit of conjunctivitis. And in the process, they eject larvae into the eye. And those larvae grow up into adults and then they mate in the back of the eye, in your conjunctiva, and they produce more larvae, which then uh, you get a lot of conjunctivitis and the face flies come back and move it on. Now, it doesn't normally happen in humans because they'll shush these flies away from their eyes. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. But this particular person just unfortunately had had a moment where some flies had that settled on her eye, had ejected these larvae in, and she hadn't shushed them away quickly enough. And consequently, some weeks later, she started pulling adult worms out of her eye. They were sort of That's crawling horrible. around in the, the orbit. Um, what was fascinating she, she, about that... She never case, saw it coming either. No, no. You can imagine how psychologically disturbing that would be. I believe the first time she noticed it, she thought she had something in her eye, so she went to the mirror and saw a worm crawling across the surface of her eyeball, which you can imagine is pretty disturbing. Um, And, you know, if if that were to happen to you, I highly recommend you go to a doctor. Don't try and deal with that yourself. Make sure you get a qualified professional to to assist you. Um, What was really interesting was when we were looking at this worm, um, I mentioned Henry Bishop earlier. He said, hey, this doesn't look like normal thalasia. In America, there is something called thalasia californiensis in dogs, which very occasionally has been found in humans. But something was different about the structure of this worm and its anatomy that didn't quite make sense. So we really had a good look at that and we found this is not Thalasia californiensis and now we had to work out, well, what the heck is this and how did this person get it? And I ended up having to go through the literature. I found a paper in German from 1928, which described a a very rare species of Thalasia, well, not, not, not rare in cattle, but uh, never before found in humans called Thalasia bellosa, the cattle eye worm. And that was what this patient had. So the epidemiology of this was that it hadn't actually come from dogs, it had come from cattle. And we thought this was incredibly rare. We published the case. Um, somebody asked me, will this happen again? And I said, look, not for decades. And the weird thing was we had another case one year later. So it, that's an example of a very unusual case, but it it's unusual also that we've had we had two cases in the space of two years, and we're worried that maybe this parasite is starting to um, find its way into humans, and that's what we call emerging parasitoses, where you know for multiple factors we might find some of these parasites start to jump species a little bit and do some things which we don't expect them to. So um, interesting case, not one which you want to get if you uh, if you can possibly avoid it. It's not nice to have worms crawling around on the surface of your eye. Oh, yeah. So. Um... What is it about you that's able to figure out that someone has a parasitic problem? Like, you know, it seems like that's a special ability of yours. What, yeah. you know, what do you look yeah. for that maybe other people don't look for? What is it? <laughs> I think it's more than anything that I'm just really fascinated and I really love these things. You know, um, I, I was one of, you may remember the, the, the boy at school who liked gross things. And I was basically that kid and I grew up and now uh, I never had to grow out of it. I get to do it as a profession. So I'm really quite passionate and interested in parasitic diseases and I'm interested in unusual parasitic diseases. And because I don't focus on one, it means that often I I have a bit of knowledge about some things which other people sometimes don't have. Um, I've kept very broad and and really try and maintain a a broad knowledge across the literature. Now, what generally happens is it's actually the doctors who first identify that there's a parasite there and they do all that sort of work. But then the problem for them is they have to work out what is this parasite and how do we stop this from spreading or from how do we control it in the, in the patient? And that's where someone like myself comes in where they'll send it to a specialist parasitologist who will then tell them what this parasite is. And that'll give them a lot of information about how the patient got infected and what the best treatments are, which they then move um, forward from there. So, um, I know what, what. What's your goal? You, you, you're enjoying understanding these parasites, seeing their action, etc. Is there any particular way in which you want to contribute further? Do you want to find ways to stop the parasites? You know, antiparasitics, or how do you Absolutely. envision yourself contributing? Yeah, so look, one of the things which I'm really interested in is improving diagnostics for parasitology. And so, you know, a lot of parasites, it can be quite difficult sometimes to diagnose them. And one of the things which I've been involved with, for instance, was developing a universal parasite diagnostic test um, when I was at CDC. So what we were doing there was um, currently, if you want to be tested for parasites, you have to have multiple tests. You know, many of these tests might detect one or two different parasites, but you tend to have to have a bit of an idea of what parasite the person might have. Um, And that's a problem when we get these rare and unusual cases because the issue is we don't know what they've got. So what we did there was we used some really advanced technology called next generation sequencing. And I won't go into how that works because it's quite complex, but basically we look at at DNA from patient samples and we can parse out what is parasitic DNA. And then from that, we can work out either what the species of parasite that's infecting the person is or 
um, at least have an idea of what, if, if it's one which we haven't seen in humans before or haven't seen at all in history, we, we can have some idea of at least what group of parasite it belongs to. And the advantage of this test which we developed was it's a single test. One test can test for anything. Now, at this stage, it only works on uh, blood. We, I believe they're still trying to um, further validate that to work in feces and uh, some of the other uh, things. But in blood, we were able to identify any parasite that infects humans. Um, from one single test, which is a real advance. And so that's what I'm really interested in. My goal is to improve diagnostics in parasitology, so to make it easier to work out what things are, and also to provide that support to the medical community um, about when they do get something unusual, what can we do? The final thing which I'm also involved with is looking at where things are. So there are a lot of control programs going on internationally for some specific parasites. And I've done a bit of work in various countries looking at prevalence of parasites in the human population, which then allows us to identify which areas need control and then to monitor uh, whether those control efforts are actually working. Um, why do you think parasites sometimes will go to someone's brain or go into strange areas of the body when maybe most of the time they don't? Or do, do parasites go wherever they can go? Well, that's an interesting and a, that's a really good question, actually. Um, some parasites have a tropism, we call it, for specific organs. So they like to go to certain organs. And one I mentioned earlier, that pork tapeworm, often goes to the brain. And it's just part of their life cycle that when it gets into a human, it thinks, oh, gol golly, I'm not in a pig. What am I going to do? I don't know. I'll go to the brain. And it seems to do that a lot of the time when it infects humans. Other parasites sometimes just get a bit lost. So, for instance, they might be meant to be in the gut, but when they get into someone for reasons we sometimes don't understand, they can go to other organs and, and cause quite a lot of pathology when they do. One of the common issues with that is when you're infected with a parasite that's meant to be in an animal, not a human. And when they get into us, they get a bit confused because they're not in the right host. One great example of this is uh, a specific species of dog hookworm called Ankylostoma caninum. There's another one, Ankylostoma brasiliense, which can do the same thing. And these infect through your skin. So often it's people walking around barefoot and they get in there. And in a dog, they'd go to the gut and they'd be perfectly happy, you know, mating and producing eggs and carrying on their life cycle in the dog's gut. But when Ankylostoma caninum or Brazilians get to a human, they get a bit confused. They, oh, wow, I'm not a dog. What am I going to do? So the larval stages can't establish an, an effect, a proper infection most of the time. So what they do is they just crawl under the skin. Now, this is another wonderful example of parasites that crawl under your skin. So these larval hookworms crawl under the skin. It's a condition called cutaneous larvae migraines, which means skin, baby worms crawling. And what you'll see is actually little tracks, what we call serpentine tracks, because they look like a snake-like sort of movement of these larvae under the skin, often around the feet where the larvae have come in. And uh, they'll just crawl there for a month or six weeks until they eventually die because they're in the wrong host. But of course, your body mounts a massive immune response to that. So you get these red welts, which are in these serpentine tracks. Some people even get blisters. Um, and that's really quite unpleasant. It's very itchy. And sometimes people get bacterial infections secondary in that. And you can imagine how upsetting it is to actually watch. It's very slow, the movement of these particular larvae, but watch this little track get larger and longer as these things crawl under your skin and multiple tracks often. And this worm is not just found in tropical countries. And that's one of the things I'd, um, I'd let people know is, you know, some of these worms aren't just found in low income uh, settings. So, you know, they have problems with this in Florida and some other parts of the US. And we have problems with it in, in parts of Australia and, and around the world as well. Do, um, I mean, do parasites get much attention? I know that, you know, in, let's say in Africa, I guess they're called uh, kind of forgotten diseases or just neglected, neglected diseases. But in the US and developed countries, again, is there much consciousness about them? Or are they kind of like uh, at a low level of research funding and interest and, and all that? I mean, I think outside of malaria, parasites perhaps don't get the, uh, the attention which they deserve. And they are in this group, which we call neglected tropical diseases. Um, I sometimes don't like the term tropical diseases because some of these are not specifically tropical. They're more diseases of poverty. Uh, in a lot of cases, or sometimes it's just you're unlucky and you got exposed to something from wildlife or from animals. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know that they do get the attention, particularly in developed countries, certainly in, in um, higher income countries, parasitic infection is far less common 
And a lot of that's because we have advanced healthcare and we have lots of money, basically. So we can afford to have really good sanitation and things like that, which you can't necessarily afford if you're living in a low income country. You know, the government can't afford to put sewage in every, everywhere, et cetera. So certainly parasitic infections are far more common in low income countries, but they do still occur in, in high income environments. And when they do occur, because they're often perceived as being only a disease of low income settings, it can take a little longer sometimes for them to be for parasitic diseases and infections to be identified in high income settings. Um, so yeah, when we do see them in that kind of context, it's often takes a lot longer for a diagnosis to be made and you'll have to see more specialist doctors. The, you know, overall, we really could do with more funding, we could do with more attention for these things because they are a problem. And as we see more and more travel and people becoming more and more uh, adventurous in their travel, so they're doing a lot of you know, adventure tours in, in places like the Amazon, et cetera. And they're also becoming a lot more adventurous with what foods they'll eat. We're starting to see more of these, what we consider to be somewhat exotic infections occurring in return travelers and occurring even you know in 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 high income settings so yeah it's it needs more attention i feel there's if you look at a lot of medical curricula in developed countries the parasitic diseases are often not covered at the depth that one might prefer um, and of course they've got so much to learn that it's very difficult to cover everything but uh, yeah we we outside of malaria parasitic disease is often quite neglected and it's a bit of a problem when you're the person who gets infected with the parasite. <laughs> yeah, you don't want, right. You want to have a proper treatment and diagnosis, et cetera. You don't want to be told you're crazy, you know, especially if Absolutely. it's real Absolutely. to you. And, you know, some people who come in with these issues do actually have um, a psychiatric uh, problem and, and, and need to be treated as such. And, you know, and that's, um, for them, it's very real. I point this out to them. For them, these experiences those who have delusional parasitosis are very real and they need to be respected in that for them, those experiences are very real. But the big take home message I'd give from this talk is if you're a doctor and you're confronted with someone who you feel may have delusional parasitosis, before you make that diagnosis, you really need to enlist the help of specialists and thoroughly investigate what is happening with these particular uh, patients. Because sometimes if you look hard, you'll find they actually do have a parasite. And sometimes it may have been acquired a long time ago. It may not be something which there's an assumption that if you haven't traveled in the last year or two, you can't have a parasite. Well, this example of strong loyalties in Vietnam veterans and World War II veterans uh, demonstrates that it may be decades before that you were infected, but you're still suffering from symptoms um, because you still have that parasite. Well, very good. Rich, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? And so well, uh, you want to see your papers on yeah, if you want to have a look at that sort of thing, um, you could have a look at ResearchGate. Um, I'm on ResearchGate. I'm also on Google Scholar. And there you could find out a bit more about some of the work I've done. And uh, there's some interesting cases there from around the world and uh, some interesting studies. Um, if anybody was interested in doing any further research on this, if they're in science, I'm always looking for PhD students. Feel free to email me. Um, you can find out a bit more about my research from the Federation University website. If you type in my name and Federation University, then um, there's some more information there. Okay, very good. Well, Rich, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you inviting me. Thanks so much. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.